All right, welcome everyone. I have my friend Leo Dion here to uh, talk about some more Mac development fun. And so first thing I'm gonna ask is, uh, when did you start using a Mac? And before you do that, you can give a little bio uh, about yourself. Sure, so my name is Leo Dion. I've been doing uh, development in the Apple space for about 10 years now. Um, I run my own company called Bright Digit, basically doing independent and freelance development in the Apple space, focusing on Swift. Uh, and I try to do stuff a little bit outside of the typical iOS um, storyboard MVC stuff. And I am more interested in Swift in other spaces. So that could be anything from like the Apple Watch um, to server-side Vapor stuff. Uh, and of course, our topic today, which is uh, Mac development. Um, I started developing, well, I started doing, sorry, um, 20 years ago, I got a master's degree in digital media and art technology. So I did a little bit of like video editing and some flash development back then. And, uh, the college had max. Um, so I was using like final cut pro and Adobe flash and all that stuff on max. And that was my first big exposure to Mac stuff. Uh, outside of good old Apple II stuff when I was a kid. Um, and so that was my first exposure. And I was like, oh, this is this is fine. I see why media people like it. Um, but then the iPhone came out and my previous employer wanted me to build a iPad app uh, for their major client. Um, and that was when I really started getting into Objective-C and Xcode and all that stuff and doing development in that space. Um, after a while, I, I think I still tend to be a heavy computer user over like an iPhone user. So for me, there's a lot more usefulness for building a Mac app for much more of the heavy duty work. Um, even with all the attempts I think Apple has made with the iPad, I still feel much more comfortable doing m more um, development and media creation on the Mac. Um, so that got me interested in doing Mac development. I have done, uh, I've had a couple of apps I've done for clients on the Mac. Um, but, um, this particular app, I think we're going to be talking about today, uh, is developer focused. So the Mac just was a perfect, uh, tool for building this app. Cool. And jumping off of that, uh, Kind of what what are your thoughts so far on iPad OS? I, I actually recently just <laughs> one of one of my friends ended up uh, giving me one for some of the work that I've done for him in the past. But uh, so I've just acquired a new 13 inch iPad with iPad OS that uh, I'm trying to trying to figure out how I actually want to use it for anything other than reading or drawing random diddles. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting with the the new keyboard and uh, I don't know. It seems like and the, especially the cursor stuff obviously that's uh, right. what do you what do you think about that so far um so i really like the ipad i think there's a, there's a use for it um it's really lightweight i like the way ipad os is set up with uh apps and how things are very um i was i don't know if i want to use the term sandboxed but kind of like separate individual and i say that as a user because i like to focus on one app and do it all, all at the same time uh, on the mac i fall prey to being a little bit multitasking too much um <laughs> so also known as not doing uh, <laughs> right exactly <laughs> you want to do. like so i i bought um i started using an ipad for like blogging and like office -y type stuff uh, a few years ago and then i was like this is great but i need a bigger screen so then i upgraded to an ipad pro second gen um, which i really like um and i pretty much use that for my non-development stuff and like i don't know if you've heard but a lot of folks in the developer community are always like oh i wish there was xcode on the ipad and i'm actually like in the opposite boat i'm like please don't put xcode on the ipad otherwise i won't get anything done um and that's like the biggest vice on 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 the Mac yeah. is like, I'll, I'll start blogging and I'll be like, oh, I wonder if this piece of code works. The next thing I know, I've built this stupid app that's yeah. only useful for me, um, but I get to try out really <laughs> cool code. So like, uh, that, I like the iPad Pro. Like I like mul the multitasking works well, like the whole split, split screen stuff. Um, and, and it works well in those cases. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really interested to see how things work with like cursor support. I, I'm, 
I wish that things would be a little bit more friendly when it comes to like keyboard uh, support, honestly, because I wish I could almost be like a heavy duty Vim user on the iPad and just know all the key codes and not have to lift a finger onto the screen. Yeah. But, um, you know, we'll see if we'll get there. Yeah, I feel, always feel like that's my my biggest holdback with I, I'm just so used to, you know, I, I, I've got the the focus ring to tab between all controls i've got i don't know just kind of all the keyboard shortcuts that i know and like to use and uh i i just know that the ipad doesn't you know it's very app dependent on whether they support any of it at all and exactly. i know they're, they're they're changing some i mean you know text fields are getting some more sort of generic uh keyboard commands that work with that or whatever but um it, it's it wasn't really set up to be that way in the beginning right. and i think it's it's kind of retroactively trying to add it and i don't know how well that'll work but uh, i mean it's clear that they're trying to add the support but uh, when you don't start with the support built in i don't know how well uh, you know other other people are going to catch on to it and if, if it doesn't work everywhere then it just seems like one of those things that uh, will will people use it it's got the the siri problem where you <laughs> you don't know right. where it works and then if you don't know if it's not exposed to you how do you how do you really discover it so yeah um, exactly but so we'll see. I, I I definitely have some some hope for it. I mean, uh, I I I like you. I don't know if I <laughs> I want developer stuff on it as well. I otherwise otherwise right. uh, I mean, uh, for my own selfish reasons, I I don't know what uh, what people really want to use the Mac for after that. <laughs> yeah, right, I, right. Just so, semi joking, but uh, <laughs> that, that's that, that that I think that's a ma major use of uh, why we I... still use Mac OS heavily. So. I think for like, uh, I've had this discussion with a few folks with, with the uh, ordeal we're going through right now. Like I know a lot of parents don't have computers and one of the prop, one of the problems and positives of the iPhone and iOS has been that the internet has become a lot more democratized. So people just don't need that like gateway computer or that Dell computer anymore in their house to do right. stuff. They can do 80% of that stuff on the iPhone or the iPad so like for the average user, like a computer really isn't necessary, but for like professionals like us, um, like a computer is necessary to compile code, build video, do audio, whatever it is. Um, and I think like with, with parents that I've talked to, like they don't have a computer in the home and all of a sudden the kids are doing like all this distance learning stuff. And it's like, well, they can't really do it off of their mom's Android or their dad's iPhone or whatever. It's like kind of like, whoops, like we forgot not everybody does have a computer to do yeah. stuff on. And as soon as you have to type something, it's like that for most for 99 percent of the users, they're not pairing a, a keyboard to their iPhone. And um, <laughs> so it's it's just one of those things that, yeah, I, I, I think the form factor of the keyboard and I mean, the keyboard's just central and even navigation with keyboard is very central to Mac OS. And, yeah, and know. it's a device that's been around for like a hundred years. Like, with typewriters. <laughs> like there's a reason why it survived so long. Right. I mean, it's uh, yeah, I key keyboards are there for a reason and uh, <laughs> people who use them, use them a lot. So yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, well, uh, that's good. And uh, so that's certainly, certainly something to, to watch out for, but uh, I, I'll be using Mac OS for probably a number of more years. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, same here, same here. Uh, but it will be interesting if we do get uh, Xcode on the iPad. I, I Well, I, <laughs> I, 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 there's a lot of things that are going to have to be on that version to make it reliable. But uh, Right, exactly. Yeah, it's it's, fun, it's funny talking about the, multi, the multitasking issue, though. I, I do find myself running into the same thing where I'll be on, you know, <laughs> working on my own code, and then I just spawn off a different project to test something out or I'm on stack overflow and spawn off a random project to diddle out some code to see if it even works. And yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm in the same boat. It's a, it's a temptation I try to avoid, <laughs> especially when yeah. I'm focused on like not coding stuff. I so, think the, yeah. the biggest hurdle is just uh, making a new project and then trying to name it something that I've already created on my desktop a hundred times before. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, that's that. Um, so other thing I want to ask you was uh, just sort of what's been uh, on your sort of journey of Mac OS development. What would you say are some of the most difficult things you've, you've run into so far with that? Sure. So um, 
the, the most of the apps I've found that getting it into the app store has been really difficult, um, especially with like developer tools. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to fathom how to make a decent developer tool app store friendly. Uh, and I'm of course talking about sandboxing. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing has been that um, the uh, one thing I do miss from developing on iOS and I've kind of figured out a way to get around this is there's no equivalent of reset simulator on the Mac. Mm. What I, what I mean by that is there are instances where I want an environment to have specific setup and it's really difficult to recreate that. Um, so my workaround for that is to use something like VirtualBox to set up a VM and then using snapshots and then using uh, building the app uh, and using it on a VM um, and doing it that way. That's like the closest I've got to a quote unquote Mac simulator, so to speak. Um, I think those are the two of the bigger things. Um, we'll probably talk about like using C++ libraries and packaging that kind of stuff as well. Um, and then, you know, there's the whole Apple stuff with certificates and provisioning profiles that are always a challenge, but not necessarily Mac specific. But I would say, uh, yeah, those are the biggest challenges I've faced. Um, yeah. is I, like those <laughs> situations. I feel like you're just summing up what I've been tackling for like the last month or so with various projects. It's like, uh, well, one of them is uh, I, I sort of maintain this open source uh, project called GitHub and um, the... <laughs> it's it's not sandbox well it's it's distributed outside the mac app store and so now it's like you know if you distribute something out the Ma- outside the mac app store you still need to now notarize oh, it right, so, yeah it's just like the the never-ending hurdles of new things you have to do to to make a user want to install your app i guess and uh it's it's i mean it's still it's still not notarized to this day because i well mostly i got to change the scripts and everything to then have this sort of notarized step in it. And uh, there's other issues there with like making sure that the frameworks are going to be properly code signed within it. And um, anyway, it's just more of more, yeah. more headaches that I <laughs> don't want to tackle. But the other one was actually Mac VMs, which um, there's with that same project, actually they use libgit, which is the C sort of open source C library yep. for interfacing with uh, Git. Yeah. And there there was a fix that we were trying to put in for a particular issue, but the first time we did it, it um, would not, <laughs> the test failed on this particular environment, which happened to be Mac OS like 10.12 and it didn't, or Ugh. 10.13, but it, the, the main culprit was actually that the file system was uh, different. It wasn't APFS. It was uh, because they upgraded it to a newer OS and all of a sudden the problem went away. And so <laughs> like, okay, great. So there's yeah. an APFS issue now. And, and so debugging that alone was like, okay, well now I got to figure out how do I even get a VM that's that old? And it's not, as far as I found, I mean, I can only find up to about 10.13 before Right. I can't find any VMs on app and finding them on Apple's site is like, you know, basically you just have to Google to figure out where they hide these VMs. And um, so it's just, I, I don't, I, I never really understood how they, well, I mean, Mac development in general, like it's not the same as iOS where everybody's just, you know, you kind of assume that everybody's on the last one or two versions basically. And, um, right. there, is, there is sort of this legacy trail where you want to support the last three or four versions. And, um, you know, to do that, it just seems like it's a total nightmare kind of. And there was a service that I actually found that does sort of ho- host these VMs in the cloud kind of thing. And uh, Well, there's actually... like Mac Stadium, <clears throat> for instance. And then there's a few like of your CI uh, environments where you can do, uh, you could specify different Mac OSs, but obviously like, that can be a bit of a challenge. I think yeah. like there there could be there could be more robustness with uh, CI and Mac OS. Like I'm just very thankful. Like at least GitHub Actions has seemed to like pick up a lot of that stuff. Mm. Um, it seems like so. Yeah. What what tool were you gonna suggest? Um, I I I'd have to put the link in the notes because I I don't, honestly don't remember what the, the yeah. site is called, but it it did have a pretty interesting like the pricey model was interesting in where you could basically just spawn off an instance 
And as long as you still have the instance running, you basically just would pay. It's kind of like AWS where you pay, you know, whatever. Like yep. it was pretty cheap. It was like because you don't need it very often. It's yeah, not like something it, where you have to pay monthly. You just pay whatever yeah. half a cent per minute and or whatever the, it is. The biggest the biggest hurdle was just getting the appropriate dev tools on there because you're basically <laughs> starting out with a clean slate. And yep. I talked to their support team actually, and they they were well aware of the fact that most people that are trying to use this are developers, and they're like, okay, well, yep. we're we're working on a way to kind of jump start you with all the tools that maybe you'd, you'd want to use or something. But so uh, anyway, I'll I'll leave a link for that service. And not that being paid for that or anything but uh, <laughs> just just so i remember myself yeah i had the same issue uh i had an ios app that was written in like swift 2 and i had to go on the website find a high sierra uh image on max uh on apple's website i had to get the high sierra set up i had a uh, x code 8 on there I had to uh, like figure out that i had to change the clock because uh their certificates are so old <laughs> uh, it was like I was just like, oh, gosh, I just want to get this app upgraded so I can use it on my host machine. Like this yeah. is ridiculous. There's, there's nothing worse than trying to debug something like that where you know <laughs> it's like, do I really care about this two users that are complaining about it? <laughs> you know, it's probably more users that actually have the problem, but you're like, right, right. Uh, just the hurdle is like a day's worth of just getting the stupid setup to where I need it to be. But right, anyway. exactly. Um, yeah. So, like, just to give you an example, like, the issue that I had run into was um, our friends across the ocean uh, use um, – I do some parsing of numbers, and they use commas and decimals, uh, intercha like, interchanged. Right. So, like, uh, somebody had run into a bug in Europe, and I was like, well, that's weird. Like, I don't have this issue. And then I realized, like, oh, once I set up the VM with their region, it was like that, that's what the issue was. And, like, I wouldn't have been able to do that on my own machine. Oh, usually I just change my region and <laughs> hope for the best. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, it's, I understand the point, though. It's uh, there, There's so many configurations that it's uh, – it is it is sort of a desire that you'd have a virtual setup for that. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's ever going to happen. But uh, right, right. There's, there's not really much incentive for them to – want people to go back I, th I think the push is really to just get everybody on the latest thing and that, that's pretty clear from the fact that the pricing model is free so yeah uh, yep, exactly just get get you to the new thing and don't worry mm -hmm. about the old but anyway that's not not how everyone works on mac os especially when you have a laptop that you know five years old or whatever and people, <laughs> people, people keep those you know it's not not like an iphone where people are pretty much on to the next thing and probably yeah. two to three years average i don't really know what the actual numbers are but right right Anyway, cool. All right. Well, uh, I think that is a good halfway point here to <laughs> switch over to some code. So yeah, let's, uh, let's let's talk about our uh, little code challenge here. Sounds good. All right. So now we're going to talk about uh, Speculid, and uh, I'll let Leon take it away on what exactly uh, that means. <laughs> sure. So uh, one of the big issues I've run into is um, I, I find, like, the way – asset catalogs require like raster images a little bit cumbersome to say the least. Um, and sometimes you might have a large set of graphics or app icons, especially with alternates now um, where you want to um, just use like an SVG file and just automatically resize them. And so that's kind of what the idea of this app is. Uh, we talked about some of the challenges that I've faced. CI was a big one. Um, I still haven't gotten CI to be set up, continuous integration set up with this because of provisioning profiles and all that stuff. So that's been a headache. Um, when I first started building the app, it was actually just a bash script um, that used image magic um, to do it. And uh, that was good at first. Um, and then I realized uh, I can actually write a Mac app. And then my first version actually just ran image magic behind the scene. And then I took it to the next level and started using like C++ libraries. Um, so that was like the next big challenge is not so much using the C++ libraries because I wrote a um, – I have a, uh, a, an Objective-C framework that I use called uh, Cairo SVG, which interfaces between the Swift and the, um, the C++ stuff. So that isn't too bad. Um, you can see that here. But um, 
then I have to figure out how to deliver the app and make sure we had talked about code signing as well with that stuff. So that stuff works. It's actually notarized and everything. But I think um, the one I want to really talk about today is understanding asset catalogs because they're kind of a uh, black box the way uh, Apple has them set up. So for instance, um, just looking at this documentation here, uh, there's a lot of like outdated stuff on here and actually missing attributes. Um, just let's look at like an app icon here. Um, the, where was it? Subtype. Um, let's go to subtype right here. Oh, here, here's a great example. The scale of the icon. Well, the subtype is not the scale of the icon. <laughs> I mean, it's just simple stuff like that, for instance. That's funny. Um, I think idiom had a few things. It's just a clear copy paste from the one right above it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to show off one that was new. Um, it, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but like screen width, there's actually more screen width options now. Um, and then the other one I wanted to look at was, um, and even some of these are kind of confusing. Like there's color space, but display gamut. I'm not seeing a use for color space anywhere, but display gamut will show that off in a little bit. And then, but there was one, um, I believe it was, actually it could have been here where uh, they added support for Catalyst, uh, but they don't actually have it documented here, which is really mm. weird. I think it might've been under. <laughs> is it weird? Under, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sue's, Sue's part for the course for, oh, it's a Mac thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, what I want to take a look at is kind of how things are set up and um, first of all, kind of go over like asset catalogs um, and then um, and how they work. But then I also want to go over how Specula does it now and how I've taken that and actually refactor that into a separate Swift package that people can take a look at right now on GitHub. Here's an example of a project which has app icons of a whole slew of sizes. Um, and it supports all the OSs. You can see all the files are missing. Um, if we go into the folder, we have a SVG file here. So just a simple graphic. Um, and then if we look at the speculate file set up for that, we see it has a path to the app icon set. It has a path to the geometry. Uh, just like with all app icons, uh, you need to have a flat image with no transparency. So we have a command here to remove the uh, alpha from the PNG file. And then we have the background color set up, which we can change to anything we want. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I didn't know you can, can you not have alpha for the app icon? It seems. Um, it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty useless to have alpha. Um, so you can't have a background in your app icon. Uh, on iOS, oh. I should, oh, okay. should say that. Yeah, okay. there we go. So yeah, you can obviously do that. <laughs> I was, uh, was going to say, I'm like, it seems wrong. Well, right? But yep. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> so uh, with iOS, you can't. So okay. uh, obviously that you know, depending on your use case, you can you can do whichever sure. you want. Um, so then all I have to do is run a command uh, to process my JSON file that I have set up here, and then I should see um, I should see all the files rendered out based on that SVG file. So we've run the command and now all the images are set up here uh, in our app icon. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's cool. So like we could also go in here and- so how, does it, how is it actually determining what it is? Is it just reading what the, uh, like how does it know what all the, um, the different categories are that it has to export to, if that makes sense? Yep, yeah, I'll show that off in a little <laughs> okay. bit. Cause we'll, we're gonna focus on, um, pick a color. Uh, do red. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to focus on how we uh, read those asset catalogs, and that'll be a great opportunity to talk about that. So just to show you, uh, did I, not, I bet I didn't save the file. Uh, or I have an extra zero. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Funds with live demo, right? <laughs> um, so where are we? Cross our fingers. Yay, red. Nice. Beautiful red. Look at that. <laughs> it's a new it's a new uh, mode. The, the best icon. Red mode. <laughs> or no, it's uh, code red. There you go. Um, so we have um, 
you know, you can change the color. The other thing you could do is it also works with uh, image sets. So you might want to resize an image. Uh, here's one where uh, let's look, let's look at that. So we have that scaled. Here's where we have, you know, size one, two, and three. The geometry is going to be um, based on the geometry set up here, whether you do based on width and it'll automatically resize based on the aspect ratio, um, the height, or you could say the height and it'll automatically calculate the width. Uh, it will then create um, PD PNG files for that. So we can then go ahead and do that. Um, so now it's going to render out 1x, 2x, and 3x. So if we go back here, we go to that, and we get 1x, 2x, 3x with the transparency because it's an image. We don't really care. Um, and then last but not least, you can have an image set with all scales, which is a PG PNG fi PDF file. So um, if we go back here and we render out that one, it'll automatically not only render out the PNG file, but also the PDF as well. So we can actually go in here. We can see we have the 1x, the 2x, the 3x, and the PDF file. So we have a vector version as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you were asking about how, uh, how it knows what size to render. So let's take a look at how Speculid does that with uh, asset catalogs. So if we go into the framework that's set up and we go to models, we see there are two um, two specific uh, classes or structs that we have set up in Swift. We have the asset specification document, um, which is basically the info that you see in a, um, in a file and the images array. So let's take a look at an example file, for instance. So let us open this one up. Um, so here's an example of one for a, um, the one we have just looking at with the PNG PDF file as well. Mm -hmm. So we have an array of images and then we have an info with an author. I put in the uh, bundle ID here uh, when I render it and then the version number. And then this stuff is all read in using codable in Swift. Um, so then um, we have the coding keys set up. We have the automatic detection of um, automatic encoding and decoding of images and info. Um, and then let's look at the actual, uh, each individual uh, asset specification. Here's the protocol, but we'll look at the actual uh, codable uh, item. So here is where we have um, all the fun stuff with an asset specification. I'm gonna make that full screen. So here we have the image idiom, which is basically the, the device. We have a scale set up uh, for 1x, 2x, 3x. Um, it's an optional because we have PDFs as well. Uh, sometimes you can have a size and sometimes you can't. With app icons, there are no sizes set up. Uh, or excuse me, with image sets, sizes are not typically set up because it uses a scale, I think. So uh, yeah, so here we go. Image set doesn't have size. Um, the file name. So when you first start off, there isn't a file name, typically the role, which is having to do with the Apple Watch, uh, and then the subtype as well. And then here is the code for just creating one. Here's the code for copying one. Uh, here's where we have our codable stuff. We use a regular expression to read in the scale because it, we want to make sure it's 1x, 2x, 3x is typically the pattern. And then we have the size, which uh, is um, separated by an X, another regular expression there. Um, so that's the fancy stuff that we're doing here. And then we read in the uh, Apple Watch role and the Apple Watch type. Um, and then here, here's the code for spitting that stuff back out based on the size and the scale uh, when we encode it back to JSON. So um, are you always starting, are, are you creating the asset um, catalog just basically empty first in Xcode and then generating the assets? Or are you actually creating new assets entirely in Xcode? Um, so right now you have to create them in Xcode and then it fills in the blank. Um, yeah. That's how it works right now. I mean, it makes um, somewhat sense just so that you, I mean, you're, you're kind of, I, I can see it going either way, I guess, but at least that way you're kind of just always populating it based on whatever the project currently has. But, right. Uh, and um, so, yeah, and I, I think the, the hope is that by release next week, we'll have uh, like fully creating uh, asset catalogs. If not in the next version, probably in a 
version pretty soon. Um, Cause I already had that pretty much set up with the uh, package we'll be talking about later. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean the kind of the intention would be is that you're setting up everything in Xcode before you go ahead and render the files. Right. And then um, what I usually do right now is when I use the app, I don't check in PNGs and PDFs into my uh, Git repo. Uh, I just check in the SVG files cause then I render those on build. If that makes sense. Yeah. So like you can look here. Um, on our example build, um, we should have, uh, I have it right now set up as a aggregate, but all we have to do um, in the latest, actually in the latest version, you don't even have to do any of this stuff. Um, it's even simpler than that. Um, you just type in process and then the directory, it'll automatically search for all the files. Um, all the speculative files within the directory. So you can do that now. Cool. Um, and I could show that right now. So is it usually one speculative file per asset or can you have multiple assets in one speculative file? Uh, right now it is just one, um, one speculative file per asset. Yes. Okay. So you can reuse, like in this case, we're reusing the same SVG file, but however, it goes to several different app icons or several right. different sets in that case yeah so does that make sense yeah i i was just thinking it might be nice if i just had like one file that defined how all my things were exported um i, I can just see people having a lot of assets over time and um wanting to kind of consolidate the number of speculative files maybe that they're, yeah. they're generating as a result but yeah i look at something see like, either way <laughs> i look at uh, one app i'm a big fan of is uh, xcode gen uh, where they have like a central yaml file yep. and i kind of like that approach and i think in the future i'd like to move more towards that to where it's just one big file and then um i think one of the challenges is uh where you start getting into things like graphics process uh, graphics feature sets and gamuts, uh, display gamuts where you might want to use certain SVGs for certain things or change certain properties for certain devices. Um, like for instance, you know, talking about like Mac app might, you know, you might want transparency on the app icon and on the iOS app, you don't, you want the nice rounded rectangle with a red background. So like that, I think is a future feature I've often thought about and figuring out a nice way for that to be set up. Um, in JSON or YAML would be the challenge, I think, at this point, is creating a good interface, coding interface for that. Yeah. Cool. Gotcha. Um, the other thing is uh, I just added uh, initialization, so you can actually create the JSON file if you pass in an SVG path and a um, path to the app icon or image set, and it'll automatically create the speculated file for you, and then you could just go in and fill in the blank for background and Removing alpha. Uh, I've been doing a lot of like getting feedback from folks. So if anybody uses this app, uh, feedback is totally welcome. But I'm looking for feedback on creating a more friendly interface when the commands are not working correctly. So there's a few other things I'm working on, but uh, pr- things are pretty much solid and on track for hopefully a release pretty soon for version two. Cool. Yeah, it'd definitely be it'd be interesting to see if there's a way that you could figure out where parsing goes wrong or something like that in a file too. And just like that case where you had an extra zero where it it would be neat if there was some, I don't don't know how that mechanism would really work with with codable stuff, but uh, maybe you could, I don't know if you could throw particular errors or something that would work for that, but um, it'd be be nice to kind (laughs) of pinpoint exactly where and then uh, display that in Xcode logs or something like that. But yeah, exactly. uh, Or the build stuff. So here's like, um, I don't know if we want to talk about it, but here is the um, updated asset catalog library that I've set up. And you can see it's a lot more in-depth um, than what we have uh, previously. Uh, just to show you an example of some of the issues you can run into is like with an app icon. Uh, I'm going to pull up this other pane here. Actually, no, image set is where it really gets gets strange. So I can easily like crash this app at crash Xcode by starting to check these boxes Hmm. because you just slowly and easily can get into like the thousands. Look how slow this thing is getting. Um, and now we add this and now we, Oh yeah, look, there we go. Rainbow wheel. So (laughs) like, um, that's like one of the big, um, issues with 
I found is when you start getting into very, very specific stuff, uh, like you want to specify display gamuts or you want to specify memory or display graphic sets, this kind of stuff here, like you can start easily getting into like hundreds of different images you need. Um, so I've created an interface in the Swift package and I'm hoping to use uh, in the next version to where um, we can uh, pull up, where's the image set template? So you can actually create uh, an image set template that this is kind of recreating what this checkbox over here is doing. Mm -hmm. So you see the checkbox is here. So it's the same idea to where like you can have set specify certain graphic feature sets and memory. And there's actually a command line app attached to this where you can create a JSON file that mimics this here. Um, and I'm wondering if I have an example. Uh, but um, yeah, here we go. So here's an example where you specify the devices. This is different from the speculate file, but basically this can be read in and then a asset catalog ind individual thing can be created. So here's an example where we just specify display gamuts. Here's a massive one where we uh, are support. We are saying it's a template icon. We specify that it's for dark mode. Uh, it also wants separate wa Apple watch screens. And then we can also specify different locales and it'll automatically create um, a corresponding uh, template here uh, for that. Um, and so I'm hoping to do that to where, like like we've just been talking about, uh, you can create uh, just the app icon in the asset catalog uh, on the fly uh, rather yeah. than having it to depend on Xcode. Um, yeah. And then, like I said, creating some sort of like query or filtering language to where you can say, I want this SVG with this background for dark mode, but I want the SVG changed to a white background and light mode and things like that. Right, yeah, I was I was thinking about that use case where <laughs> if you have the SVG image already, it would be cool if you could swap uh, certain attributes of different things, but uh, yeah. yeah, it gets a little tricky because you probably don't, you probably almost want to be able to specify a color that you're, um, cause maybe you don't actually want like pure black or pure white or something like that. So, yep. but, uh, yeah, but there, I think there's a lot, a lot of room for improvement. And I think there's a lot of ways you can just use a simple SVG file and just do little modifications to it when yeah. you render out some of these graphics rather than having to depend on Photoshop or sketch and load it every single time your graphics designer wants to change the SVG file or the image just slightly. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, I mean, it's definitely nice having the defined scale, defined sizes as well, just for like intrinsic content size purposes and stuff like that. But yep, um, exactly. So it's uh, yeah, I, I've I've tried kind of working with just PDF stuff in general, and it's it always seems wonky, and unless you really have the the predefined sizes, uh, sometimes you get into weird cases that <laughs> you don't want it to be certain sizes, and it becomes certain sizes. But so. yeah, um, just to just to touch base on the documentation stuff. So here's an example of where like they're missing, they were missing like the newer watch sizes mm. in the asset catalog. And then I want to find the part device subtype. Yeah. So somehow they have like, when they added Mac catalyst, they added it under device subtype, which mm. had only different watch sizes <laughs> Interesting. and that is not documented. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's just another example of like where documentation could use improvement. Yeah. <laughs> just a lot of places but uh, <laughs> i i wish I, some, some days i just wish i kind of worked on that team and uh, could go through all the <laughs> but just write like a long book of uh, i'll just have to do that separately outside of apple i guess well I, i've almost thought about writing my own like asset catalog documentation now that i have a yeah. lot of this stuff it's on my to-do list yeah uh, so maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe google will find me more favorable than what apple has provided <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I everybody always keeps uh, saying that I should do the do a book on something, and I'm like, yeah, I just I have to get the motivation to want yeah. to actually do a full book. It's right. not easy. Right. Totally, totally. Anyway, well, yeah. awesome. Uh, this is uh, pretty neat, and I'll have to play around with it because uh, I just know at work we. I, I think the biggest thing for us is I I want a way to go from just here's my sketch file to here's all the assets that I want. And I, I, I haven't really found that nice flow yet, but uh, maybe, maybe there is a way that I can define that. But it seems, yeah. seems like it seems like a pretty manual process at the moment. And uh, not that well, I do it every day, but, you know, changes come in. It would just be nice if uh, I could press a button and 
kind of all does it for me. But yeah, so right now I have documentation on the website for exporting SVGs from specula or uh, from Sketch and uh, Illustrator or Photoshop. So if you can just can, export, can, can one... you can you actually define individual sections that you want exported or? Um, what do you mean exactly? Uh, like how how do you define exactly which like in the the sketch file there's like the big storyboard kind of thing that they have there and how do you define individual <laughs> like can you define individual components that you want to be uh, exported in that case you or? can i believe it, the way it works and i haven't used sketch in a while but like you can define a certain storyboard and have that exported as a svg file okay. um and that's the way it works right now um so typically what I do is I'd use something like their app icon template and then pick the largest image on that app type icon template and say that could be exported as a SVG mm -hmm. um, and then use that in Speculate. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. sounds good. Um, I'll let you have the last minute here to plug any other things that you work on or uh, company stuff, whatever you want to plug. Sure. So um, I'm always looking for new freelance work. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. My company is Bright Digit, which uh, is on Twitter and also brightdigit.com. My Swift stuff, uh, if you're ever interested in my Swift content, it's learningswift.brightdigit.com. And then I have a podcast, uh, Empower Apps, which I'm close to reaching 50 episodes on where we talk nice. about development in the Apple space, uh, Mac stuff, iOS, backend, all that we have a lot of great guests um definitely you should check out empowerapps.show that's the url and then uh last but not least uh you can check out speculate at speculate.com we're looking at a version two release pretty soon uh beta four i just released today so i'm hope i am hoping and looking for any testers if you are interested and your feedback would be very very welcome so awesome. thank you for having me on i really appreciate it it's been fun yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always fun, <laughs> even though I've yeah. only done two of them, but <laughs> both of them have been fun. Uh, I'll leave all the links for all that in the, the description of this video, and uh, I'll, I'll see everyone next week. See you, Lucas. Thank you. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, give this video a like, and share it with your friends. Ways to contribute and additional information are in the description. I'll see you next week. <laughs>